All right. Hello, everyone. Um, really great to have you guys here. Um, just before we start, if people could put in the chat where they're from. And then we also have a poll. Okay, we have one from LA. And Green Bray, California. Another LA. And Mill Valley. And we're just going to start in about five minutes, just waiting on some more people. Okay, then I'm getting back from our poll that we have 43% of us are under 18, 14% 18 to 23, 14% uh, 24 to 29, 14% 30 to 35, and 14% 48 plus. Cool, so yeah. Okay. All right. I'm going to get started just with some introductions. Um, first of all, my name is Walker Lachlan. I am the Program and Development Manager for Wellkind. Um, just to give a bit about our forestry program. So, the goal of the Wellkind Forestry Program is to promote greater forest health, resilience, and biodiversity in a climate-changed world. Uh, we're using a lot of innovative forest management techniques and practices to kind of help our local forests and wildlife adjust to some of the drastic changes like drought that are occurring 
with greater and greater intensity every year. Um, as part of this larger forestry program, we have the internship program for forest management and communications. And the goal of this one is to form the next generation of green professionals and environmental stewards. Um, we work with high school students in the San Francisco Bay Area, Northern California, giving them academic and vocational training in working as a forester, using our innovative methods, and then also doing environmental communications projects like blogs, um, MIDI videos, and social media. So our first session of this internship uh, was this year, and over eight weeks, we had interns working at restoration sites, um, getting on into hands-on work, doing soil tests, water quality tests, then also working on a habitat management plan with research and writing. And the end of this eight-week session is our special career panel event, which is to kind of show these interns and the larger public some, some awesome emerging careers in the environmental sector that are working towards protecting wildlife and forests um, as they struggle to adapt, adapt to climate change. So I'm sure many of you probably saw today that there is a quite alarming new report uh, by the UN about the impacts of climate change. We're seeing more and more how important these jobs are for young people to get involved in them. So we're very pleased to have some great panelists uh, from a variety of areas within environmental work to kind of talk about their day-to-day -day jobs, share advice about how interns and other people of varying ages can break into the career, and then also explain sort of what they do as a professional in the fight against climate change. So just going in alphabetical order, we have Cameron Shesa. He is a master's candidate in environmental studies at California State University, Fullerton. His master's project is looking at stable carbon isotopes in plants as a way to see how their water use efficiency responds to environmental factors like proximity to the coast. Um, and this is, very new research because while stable carbon isotopes are used pretty often in geology, it's innovative to be using these in the study of plants. We also have Catriona McGregor Glazebrook. She is the executive director of Wellkind um, in you know, award-winning career spanning multiple areas. She's prepared hundreds of habitat management plans um, led the conservation efforts for one of the largest sanctuaries in the United States, which earned her a Blue Ribbon Award in conservation. She's prepared national and international education programs for K through 12, worked at designing policy at the state level for environmental and outdoor education. And she has also been the director of vocational education programs and environmental careers. Then we have um, Jack Gescheit. He is an environmental photographer and activist who has been a professional photographer since 1987. Um, his Tree Spirit project started in 2003 and has appeared in media around the world. The goal of this project, in his words, are to raise awareness of the critical role that trees play in our lives, both globally and personally. And it kind of draws from his experience as an environmental activist and his boyhood love of nature. We also have Jared Holmes, a zoologist, ecologist, and conservation biologist who's working in the hill country of central Texas. Jared has been the zoologist and director of education for the Bamberger Ranch Preserve in Johnson City for over eight years. Um, He's an expert on lizards and helps advise landowners on making best use of their property for biodiversity. 
And last but certainly not least, we have Zachary Ellis. Uh, Zach is the co-owner and operator of Catalyst Bioamendments, which is a business that helps growers and farmers transition to biological sustainable practices. So with Catalyst, uh, Zach helps these farmers make compost that is rich in microbial life and nutrients that benefit the soil. One big effect from climate change is that you're seeing across the board a lot of reductions in the health of our soil. So the work of Zach and his company is getting more and more important. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to our panelists. Um, each one of them is going to speak about their day-to-day -day roles, give some advice, and then share any predictions they might have about their career field. So first we have Cameron, you can take it away. Awesome, thank you, Walker. Um, hello everybody, I'm Cameron. I'm gonna share my screen here real quick. The relatively short presentation that I will share with you guys. This is it. Yep. And let's see, get this out of the way. Okay, cool. Um, thank you for asking me to, to be on the panel, Catriona. Uh, it's cool to be uh, speaking alongside a bunch of other very interesting um, people in the environmental career field. So I just want to start off, who am I? I'm a normal dude. I like to rock climb. These are a bunch of pictures of me rock climbing. Uh, I feel like one of my primary identifications as a human is just like being an outdoors person. Um, my dad grew up in the bush in Australia. They call it the bush out there. The back country, if you want to call it. And so he spent a lot of time fishing and hunting and uh, just kind of being in nature. And so he uh, instilled those same values in me. And I've carried those into my adult life and intend to continue to do that throughout my life. Um, I have many passions related to the outdoors. And that's ultimately kind of the impetus for my desire to pursue a career in the environmental sciences. Um, and uh, I have a BA from a small liberal arts school in Oregon uh, called Willamette University in environmental science. And I actually just finished my master's degree um, in environmental studies at Cal State Fullerton. I turned in my thesis last Friday. Um, so I'm really happy to be done with that. It's like, yeah, um, doesn't feel real, but uh, yeah, I'm just a normal guy. So my graduate research project is uh, basically looking at cloud cover, um, i.e. maritime or maritime influences, i.e. cloud cover as a possible driver of the ecological distribution of plants in Southern California. So Southern California is really unique in that it's a desert, but it's right next to the ocean. And so there's a very uh, marked contrast in vegetation type going from coast to inland. You have plants that are capable, that are drought deciduous, uh, living closer to the coast and uh, can grow, um, can basically grow there because of these maritime influences that are alleviating drought periods. So one thing that clouds do is they retain soil moisture uh, for longer into the year. So come around June, May, um, a lot of you may have heard of May gray and June gloom. It starts to get dry. However, since May gray and June gloom uh, exist, and since clouds kind of hang around for a little bit closer to the coast, the moisture available to plants is available for longer into the year versus just even 25 miles further inland where cloud cover burns off more quickly. You don't see cloud cover as much um, throughout the year compared to the coast. And so um, 
basically coastal sage, which is closer to the coast, is characterized by small uh, drought deciduous shrubs that um, that need a lot of moisture in order to persist. And that moisture just has to be there at some point in the year. And then further inland, uh, it looks a little more like chaparral. And so there are differences in physiological uh, mechanisms that these plants have in order to survive in their respective environments. And so basically I took two species, one at either end of this gradient that I just talked about um, of high levels of cloud cover and moisture at the coast and low levels of cloud cover and moisture inland. And I took plant samples, leaf samples specifically of those plants across a spectrum. So I had five interior sites uh, and five coastal sites. And um, I obtained a carbon isotope ratio, which is basically a proxy for plant water use efficiency responses uh, to climate conditions. And what these, what that means is that we can tell whether or not a plant has experienced drought stress, which is essentially um, a physiological, which basically elicits physiological responses in these plants that allow them to survive. And so that's kind of what plant physiological ecology is, ties into that, is that it's a study of plants behavioral and physiological adjustments to environmental stressors in order to survive. So in my case, the environmental stressor that I'm looking at um, as, uh, as a means of investigating uh, cloud cover as a possible driver of the ecological distribution of plants in Southern California is drought stress. And how does this tie into climate change? Uh, it basically ties into climate change um, because understanding what sorts of physiological responses climate change will elicit in plants will further scientific knowledge of how plant can, communities behave in relation to anthropogenic changes. And climate change is kind of a, an environmental stressor itself. It's kind of the ultimate environmental stressor. It affects everything. Uh, so understanding how our plants are responding to those changes is gonna be important in informing future habitat restoration efforts um, in ecology and conservation biology. And drought periods are expected to become longer as the climate continues to change and intra-annual rainfall pulses um, occur more frequently and with higher intensity. So the survival of these plants is dependent on their ability to respond to the available of resources at different times of the year. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of what, that's like uh, maybe the simplest way that I could put it. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, so I wanna talk about day-to-day -day research activities. Um, the first thing, and this is what was really, uh, um, I guess, uh, focused on in undergrad was research and writing. Uh, so re reading and writing and research have been the, uh, of utmost importance in uh, throughout my education, and they will be important in um, as I move forward in my career. And one of my favorite teachers in undergrad, Joe Bowersox, says that we write so that we can come become better thinkers. And I think that's true. I've found that the more that I've written, the more clearly I can think. And the more I write, the harder it makes me think about what I'm thinking about. I have to figure out how to articulate it and communicate it, which is important in science. Um, and then, yeah, what I did, a lot, you know, sci I feel like science, uh, especially the type of science that I, I'm doing is, is put on a pedestal. And um, there are some like mundane tasks involved with like grinding up leaf samples, for example, and packing them into tiny tins. I spent hours and hours using little tweezers, um, to fold, well, to using these tiny little instruments to scoop out ground leaf matter, a very tiny amount, put them into these tiny tins, fold them up very specifically so that they were ready to be fed into an in instrument to get this carbon isotope ratio. And um, the fun part was going out and collecting the leaf samples, figuring out where these two plants that I needed to sample leaves from occur in Southern California in coexistence. 
So I, I found ultimately found 10 sites. I spent a lot of time driving around. I spent a lot of time on apps like iNaturalist looking for historical identifications of these plants um, and ran into a lot of issues because it's an open source app and not everybody correctly identifies plants. So there were a lot of times where I drive for an hour and then the plant that I tried to get was actually the or that, that I intended to get was um, an incorrect identification by somebody who had posted the, their identification on this app. Um, oh yeah, it was kind of like a, it was a hunt for these plants. It was a lot of fun. Um, and I, I really enjoyed that part of just trying to figure out where these plants grow. And uh, yeah, yeah, it was, it was definitely an adventure. Um, the instrument that we use to get this carbon isotope, stable carbon isotope ratio uh, is called a Picaro G212i carbon isotope cavity ring down spectrometer. Sounds very fancy, it is. And uh, stable isotopes have historically been um, analyzed via mass spectrometry. So this is kind of a newer instrument. And the way that it works is uh, samples are delivered to this ring down spectrometer as gaseous CO2 after combustion and a COSTEC combustion module. So basically the plant material that I sampled, the leaf samples were combusted at greater than 980 degrees Celsius. So super hot. And then there are a bunch of lasers inside the instrument that can basically analyze the CO2 and measure the carbon isotope composition. And then um, there are calculations that are done. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to do the, the actual running of the samples. I didn't get experience with that because of the pandemic. It was just easier to have the person who's um, who was running the lab do that. So yeah, that's that. Um, real quickly, how did I end up here? It was pretty much by accident. <laughs> um, I did not really work that hard in undergrad. And so that's part of the reason I went to grad school. And I met my research advisor because I applied to a job in his lab as a student assistant. And he saw that I worked at REI for a year and thought that that would be applicable experience to working in his lab. And I, had not, I, I didn't know anything about physiological ecology, let alone stable carbon isotopes. And so I kind of winged it. Um, and learned along the way. And I think that that, I feel like that's actually probably more typical than I thought it was. So these really kind of fancy sounding uh, areas of scientific research, I, I feel are actually a lot more accessible than, um, I don't know, we're led to believe. Uh, yeah, so totally, yeah just did not happen the way that I thought it would. Um, possible career paths. I think probably the most applicable would be uh, either biologist or habitat restorationist. Um, and there are a couple of others um, here as well that you've probably all heard of. And um, regenerative agriculture, urban farming and sustainable native landscape and garden design. Uh, are a couple of new emerging career paths that I think are probably actually going to be in, in high demand. Cool idea I had, maybe somebody can pursue this in the future, is sustainable native landscape garden design uh, as a way of restoring native habitat. So focusing on planting native plant species that are um, uh, in you know whatever area you live uh, or work as a way of restoring the environment back to its, uh, I guess, natural environmental conditions. Um, yeah, there's a lot of private land that a lot of people have a lot of non-native plants on. Um, as far as predictions for my um, particular field of research, um, stable carbon isotopes, or actually just stable isotopes in general, um, will, probably become more and more useful. I mean, we'll probably be continue to be utilized in physiological plant ecology. So my particular field of study um, and 
these stable isotopes can persist for millions of years in substrate. So being able to look at uh, historical plant communities and how they interacted with the climate, you know, millions of years ago can hopefully give us some insight into, or maybe, maybe we'll be able to discover something that's uh, useful and applicable to the situation at hand today. So that's all I've got. Thank you guys. Yeah. Thank you so much, Cameron. And yeah, definitely very useful for anyone who's interested in going to grad school, pursuing science. I know a lot of our interns have that. So thank you. Um, next up, we have Catriona McGregor Glazebrook. And yeah, she is the wonderful executive director of our organization, Wellkind. Thank you. Thank you. And that's that's a hard act to follow, <laughs> Cam. I really enjoyed that. And uh, carbon isotopes are really important, too, for proving the changes in the atmospheric uh, environment and how uh, naturally occurring carbon is actually going down. But man-made carbon is going up. There are different kinds of isotopes. So it's interesting to, to do the study. Um, okay, well, um, my background is uh, maybe a little unusual. I don't expect people to follow exactly my, my career path. Um, I was born into a family that kind of ancient, ancient Celtic. So, you know, very open to listening to the trees and interacting with nature. And um, so I grew up as, as a kid that way, very much in, in attunement with nature and listening to trees, sleeping in trees. And, um, but I found that no one, no one believed that. So I thought, you know, I was on a mission to uh, become very knowledgeable about policy, law, science, all of these fields. So I have a very diverse background um, in science. I have a master's of science in resource management and administration. I also have a, a law degree. I, I focused on environmental law. And what I really love is taking what I've learned into practical application because the time is now. And I believe we, we need to start immediately applying some of these uh, methods uh, to uh, the earth and to the environment because of where we are today. I'm going to start with some of the interesting new career trends that I've noticed and kind of move on with what I call more uh, advice for our interns or any young people um, that's kind of general career advice as well. So climatologists, this is a whole new evolving field. I think it's absolutely fascinating. And uh, people can either work in the field or on the ground for uh, climatology um, to gather samples and collect data very much um, like what Cam is doing. And you can also look at long-term trends and collect data from really fascinating new sources. Like there's a lot of satellites up there um, which are gathering broad global um, information. Um, so that's a brand new field. It's exploding right now. It's fantastic. It's needed. And uh, this is a great area for people to get expertise in. Um, ecologists and botanists, I want to speak to that a little bit. You know, in the olden days, under the indigenous lore and wisdom keepers, um, it was really important to follow the wisdom of the plants and land and the animals. And then we kind of lost sight of that. So unfortunately, um, I would say, especially starting in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, a lot of the jobs um, related to studying science were more about manipulating science in the lab. I do see a really hopeful new trend of needing for uh, people who understand the plants, who understand uh, the processes of nature occurring. So I see this big shift back um, almost like reinventing the way indig our indigenous elders looked at the earth to uh, hire people and have them become knowledgeable about the seasons and uh, what is causing different changes to the plants and really under understanding them. And of course, from becoming wise about nature, I think we'll be much better able to handle the challenges we're facing. Environmental health, another exploding field out there for people that are interested. Environmental health is really looking at the new um, impacts to planetary health, human health, plant, and even animal health. And you can work on that at the policy level, um, or you can also look at it from, um, co again, collecting samples. So the nice thing about these fields, if 
you want to be in the field, you can be in the field and be a climatologist or an environmental health, or if you want to be uh, doing more oversight like policy, there's, there's room for that too. Lawyer policy analysts, we need good people to shape new policies and laws uh, because we will eventually need to change our laws and policies so that they're more in attunement with uh, natural processes. And of course, inventors and entrepreneurs, there's all kinds of amazing alternative energy, new energy, ways people are cleaning the oceans. Many of these inventions are coming up from the minds of young people. Um, who are then able to, to implement. So this is a very exciting field. Um, I just want to show a couple of slides. So I know our interns who went through our program learned about what I call dendrochronology. And it's almost like if we could ask the trees, how's it going for you? What are the changes that have happened over time? Dendrochronology is one of the best ways of doing that. Um, so again, taking samples, uh, using information from from nature directly. I mentioned satellites. I look at a lot of satellite data when I'm looking at overriding trends in our environment. And there are a plethora of satellites, maybe too many satellites up there now, but there's a lot of satellites. Um, some of them are looking at what's called the vegetation drought response. <clears throat> some are looking at the earth breathe because you can actually watch the earth breathe from space as plants do photosynthesis. They emit this beautiful green glow, which is called uh, phosphorescent photosynthesis, and we can track that to track the the breathe, the breath, and the health of the planet. Um, some of the more general advice that I will have for young people or anybody interested, who you know, even an older person interested in a career change, um, is to, or even not working in the career, just for everybody is to pay attention to signs and trends. We're becoming a society that is very focused on technology. Uh, we're in front of our computers, our TV, and our uh, cell phones, and we're losing track of what's happening outside our door. And sometimes we don't need to hear from experts. Sometimes if we just put in the time and spend the time to explore and understand what's happening, um, we ourselves can become expert. We ourselves can, can understand what's, what's happening. So that's my first bit of advice to anybody on the planet. Um, <clears throat> another general bit of advice, and again, this is to anybody too, I guess, is never lose track of your passions or dreams. You're going to hear from people today that have taken all different paths to do something that they love, that they are getting a lot of benefit from. They're all different ways. So it's not always an A to Z pathway, but if you hold on to your passion and you hold on to your dreams, I guarantee you you're gonna get there. You may not get there the way you expected, but you will. I think also everyone, myself, everyone else included, we have to um, be aware that there are other things happening around us. There are other things happening to the planet right now. This is a very important time in our history at, uh, of humanity, in the history of the earth. So while we have our own individual passion, we're also called forth by the world, by humanity, uh, by communities, by our friends, by our business colleagues, and so forth. Um, so trusting that uh, there is an element of guide guidance, uh, both are at play in wherever we en end up. And that's good, that's a good thing. Um, because we may have our own ideas and dreams, um, but maybe that's not the best way to go and we can learn as we go from the world and people around us. Other thing that I think is really important uh, for young people, especially as they're launching into their careers, is to find your people. That's really important. Take those interviews, meet people, ask questions about what it's like to work in different places or what kind of skill sets will you be um, working a lot on the computer or analyzing data? Will you be interacting with people? Will you be out in the field more um, enjoying the, the beautiful blue sky and, and, and trees and so forth? So kind of understanding what's involved in the, um, in the um, job or career. And then, you know, align yourself for success, understand differences, different people coming together. We need everyone. Look at the folks on this panel. There are some people going out in the field collecting this very valuable data. There are other people applying this data. 
to, to what they do. Uh, there are other people that are showing us through their photography and their art and their message um, what's happening. We need all kinds of people, all kinds of skills and talents. Um, also, do your own research. We covered this in our uh, internship class. Uh, we covered how, you know, when I was growing up, there were over two, 200, 300 separate media sources. Nowadays, the majority of media is owned by six companies. Um, it's really important to do your own research. Feel confident in, in what you learn. If you have to go and look at, um, spend some time looking at, hey, what, what, were, what were the temperatures um, annually in the 12 major cities in the US over the past 30 years to prove to yourself that climate change is happening, that there's global warming happening. Um, do it, don't just listen to other people. Do, you, do your own research. And it's really good to look at raw data. Uh, don't be, uh, be brave, ask for the raw data. If somebody's saying something is this way or that way, say, I wanna look and uh, look and see your data. So here are some of the really um, incredible things that are happening now, um, side by side with uh, many of the issues that we face in the world. We have people turning deserts into forests in Jordan. Um, Iceland is finding a tree that can handle a warming climate. And Africa is using herds of goats to turn, turn barren land into really rich land. So these are all opportunities. I'm not gonna go on, go on about these more. Um, and this in particular is um, really important. And I only have this here for this generation of college students. Um, the amount of debt that a college student has to acquire in some cases is terrible. And so my message to you is as you go forth, you're side by side trying to get the best education that you can. Also protect your freedom and your freedom is being debt free. And when you are free, then you have more choices about what kind of career you'd like to do, or maybe you'd like to start your own company. So this is really important message for this particular generation, find ways, hold your freedom. It's one of the most valuable things uh, that you own. So I hope it wasn't too general for everybody, but uh, those are my few, few uh, words of wisdom. And uh, I'm just really glad to be here and thank you too for all the panelists that have joined us. Thank you so much, Katriona. Always inspiring. Um, next, we have Jack Gescheit. Um, as I mentioned, he is an environmental photographer and activist. Um, he's been involved in our internship program because he's um, highly involved in um, protecting the endangered Thule elk at Point Reyes National Seashore in the Bay Area. Um, and also, you know, internationally recognized photographer, and it's really great to have him here. So take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, I remember a time before pandemics, unless you're over 100 years old. And, you know, it's because I'm an old guy, old enough to be many of your fathers and probably terrifying to think grandfathers. I'm old enough to be your grandfather um, that I actually prefer being in a room with fellow human beings rather than over the interwebs here if that's what you kids call it uh, but I'll try to make do um, because in my humble opinion and probably everyone here might resonate with this certainly based on what Kat just said she would um, we don't spend in my humble opinion enough time in the natural world anymore even again I'm 60 years old just a little over and I grew up off leash playing in the woods, playing in a swamp, literally in a swamp that was in my backyard alongside the stream in Westchester County, New York, where oddly enough, I am right now visiting friends I haven't seen in years, what with the pandemic, restricting travel. And for me, I should end with this note, but I'm just gonna start with it. That's the problem. If we're not connected to the natural world, if we don't grow up feeling it in non-rational, non-linear, and emotional ways, we can study it till we're blue in the face and we'll continue studying it as we are as a collective culture right now, as we go off the cliff of self-destruction 
in climate denialism and climate change study without actually taking decisive action as Walker referenced in a New York Times article that came out today telling us what we've known for about 20 years, which is, yeah, we're causing a climate crisis. It's global warming, folks. The globe is heating and we're measuring it and studying it. And it's no diss to science. I'm, I'm totally <laughs> impressed with what I could follow of young Cameron's presentation and his kind of science. And that kind of study is essential in proving, proving uh, what we need to prove to move forward, way back to say Al Gore's presentation. But for me, defining who I am and why I do what I do, which I'll get to in a moment, um, at a certain point, like, okay, we're bright as a culture, we're homo sapiens, we're supposedly the brightest species on the planet, certainly arguably in some measure the most intelligent, to which I say, um, respectfully, who cares if we're not wise, if we're not wise enough to act and actually right our ship of state, which to mix metaphors is hurtling over the you know, lemming cliff uh, with the ice caps melting because of our mostly fossil fuel activity and of course consuming huge amounts of cattle, which is the number one reason we cut down forests and as you can see from my fake background behind me, because I'm indoors on a computer screen, go figure the irony of that one and the paradox, I love trees. It's my happy place. I love being outside among trees. And if it were up to me, as it was a couple of weeks ago, I would give a presentation to anyone who'd come listen to me in Marin County, where I currently live, and be sitting out under trees. Because the messages there from the trees, when I'm not running my mouth, are far more important than anything I can say. It's our connection to the natural world of which we are a part and of which we've created a dystopian society which disconnects us from that palpable known sense, our own innate intelligence and wisdom beyond world, words and beyond even a rational thought that trees matter, that they support life on this planet, that we and they, animals and plants, have an exchange called we breathe out what they need and they breathe in what they need. And uh, Cameron, I'm sure, could put it more scientifically, but you know what I'm saying. So, oh, by the way, I'm Jack Gescheit, and I've created something called the Tree Spirit Project. And I'm, I do feel these days I'm kind of doom and gloom, which I, I apologize for, but it's, it's only the flip side of how deeply I feel love for the natural world. And as an example of that, I have with me one of these little iPhone devices. You've, you've heard of them, kids? And this is what I do in my spare time, because, you know, I'm just like your mom and dad or grandma and grandpa. So when I'm here in Austin, I record this. That's the sound of cicadas, which we don't have so much back in California, not that many and not that loud because there's a drought. So <laughs> as an example of what a drought is to anybody here on the East Coast or not on the West Coast, when I wash my hands, there's a bucket in the sink so that I catch the water from that. When I brush my teeth, I do it over a bucket. When I flush the toilet, I do it with water I've captured from the shower because we're now monitoring how much water we use because there's not enough. So again, more doom and gloom, I'm sorry about that. And um, I will share, I could go on here, but let me share a few pictures to show that I do some stuff rather than just complain. Um, and let's see if I have that right. Desktop. Do, do, do. Bear with me, folks. Can anyone see anything there? Tree Spirit Project? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so that's, you can also just Google naked people in trees as a phrase I don't have much competition for. And that will take you to my original body of environmental artwork. Um, I dropped out of two colleges, never completed. So for those folks who wanna to try to accomplish something in the world like Woody Allen and Chevy Chase and wonder if you need a college degree, you don't. I'd certainly recommend it. <laughs> I advise that colleges are wonderful. I miss them, but uh, that wasn't my path. I've not been much of a planner and I'm still not, but gosh, I love what I do. And that involves uh, making photographs like this one with, um, <laughs> the largest collection of naked people communing among trees, including that woman up top there 
who's a tree sitter, don't you know, trying to protect that beautiful coast live oak in Berkeley, where else? And it's how I first realized that I could, as a photographer of nature and just an enjoyer of nature more than anything, could use photographs to draw attention um, for the public through the media to raise awareness about the things I talk about, which is the critical role trees and the natural world, not just trees, but trees certainly play in our lives. And as Walker said in my intro, both globally for the role they play in um, regulating the climate in this planet we all call home, and then also just personally, after this talk of sitting indoors in an air conditioned environment, because it's muggy here today and I'm not used to it, and I didn't want my computer to overheat, I'm gonna go outside and listen to those cicadas munching away again and be among the trees. And that's my happy place. It always has been, and it seems to be always the case. But lately, I've been involved in a place called Point Reyes National Seashore. And this is a national park since 1962. But um, again, because this is a short presentation, uh, meaning I'm seven minutes and 50 seconds in, um, cattle interests have corrupted as they do, as big businesses can, especially extractive industries, this national park. And now the National Park Service has become the National Bovine Service and is their policies are actually directed at killing the elk or as they say, managing the elk. Air quotes meaning shoot to kill, starve them to death in corralled areas because that benefits the cattle ranches owned by private companies that extract, well, basically pollute the soil and <sighs> devastate the land and harm a national park of all things for goodness sake. And at the uh, detriment, not just to the Thule elk, you'll see those words at the top of that uh, map there, which is Tamales Point where there's a fenced herd, fenced in so they can't get off land um, that is um, drought stricken and they are dying. And I, I, I guess I'm willing as I'm older now in a way I wasn't when I was younger to feel the pain of that, that terrible things can happen in the world, which it's just much nicer to turn on Netflix and watch a nice science documentary. But um, my calling, and I certainly encourage anyone and everyone of any age to follow your passion. If you feel passionately about the natural world and any of my words resonate with you or anyone of this panel is follow your passion. Or as um, a wise guy called the Buddha once said, believe nothing, no matter where you read it, no matter who said it, even if I have said it, I meaning the Buddha, not Jack Gishite, unless it agrees with your own wisdom and your own common sense. And that may be to become the next, um, you know, three times PhD professor, if that's your calling. Or it might be, in my case, to first be a copywriter at an agency in New York, an ad agency in New York, not be happy with that because I didn't want to just use my word skills and my sense of humor and my put on a show desires um, to sell products. After a time that was fun and it was well paying but I was dying inside. I watched people, really old people, like in their 50s, <laughs> and they weren't happy. They were making good money in that house in Connecticut, but they weren't happy. And I knew that wasn't my path. N not that you can't be in advertising and be happy. And it's not my choice, or I mean, it's not my judgment of what anybody else should do except for me. So for me, it was to get involved in Point Reyes and to stir up trouble. So uh, thanks to me and many other activists, this is the cover of yesterday's Sacramento Bee. Not my photograph, by the way, wish it was, but they sent their own photographer, Preserve the Herd. And this wonderful article, you can be Googled. It's also will be on my website when I get home and put it on my website, treespiritproject.com, talks about the issues of Point Reyes and how really they are in macrocosm of what's going on in the world, which is, <sighs> cutting down forests, raising cattle for human consumption, using massive amounts of fossil fuels, as well as of course, generating massive amounts of methane from those cattle, because it tastes good and it's our habit. And the myth is that it's normal, natural and necessary to do so, when now that there are about 8 billion people on the planet, that's not sustainable, despite what the advertising industry and the public relations industries would have you believe about eco beef and regenerative ranching and, other such, how shall I say this, 
public relations fantasies. It's like clean coal. We need to be eating a whole bunch less meat, uh, especially beef. Part two to that, or second page in that article. Indeed, the elk are sacred, but so is the land, and so are all the animals, and so are all the plants. And it is my deep love for all of those creatures which motivates me to do anything these days. And uh, for some reason, I mean, for good or bad, I mean, I'm on the verge of tears most of the times these days because of what we do and how ignorant we are for the, you know, the, the apex, supposedly most intelligent species in the planet. Um, so I use my little graphic skills to make this variation of an old poster you may remember, if you're old enough to remember an old poster. And indeed, only you, you folks out there, it's your planet. Please forgive me and my generation for not doing a better job. I tried my best. I am still trying my best and I will continue to try for the next 20 or 30 years of my life. It's not much left compared to how much I've lived relatively inactive. And I feel a sense of shame actually that I haven't done more. So I am dedicated to this. And um, again, I, I hear the doom and gloom that comes through me, but yeah, it, it's, this is my presentation in, in 10 or 12 or 15 minutes at this point. Um, but if people were around me, it's like, let's go out into nature and let's study and help and play. And um, for me, try to do what I can and be inspired by people like Greta Thunberg, who is more your age, that one person can make a phenomenal difference and send ripples out into the society, uh, our collective of human beings connected and really change things for the better. We don't have to go down, despite what the New York Times said today, which is, yeah, it's gonna get hotter. It, it doesn't have to get as hot as it's going to get if we continue holding course. So, um, <laughs> it's a separate talk as to how that's a career path. I've worked on my own as an entrepreneur with my Tree Spirit Project. And now in addition, doing some work with In Defense of Animals, one of many great organizations, um, working with a large group of people, you'll find your tribe this way. Follow your passions, whether it be for the environment or anything else. And you'll find like-minded individuals. Um, a friend of mine, I'll never forget him, uh, Steve Axelrod of Brooklyn, when he was giving me, you know, uh, girl advice in my 20s, and he was in his 30s, and he was saying, don't go to bars, Jack. The only one you'll meet there are alcoholics, unless you're an alcoholic and want to meet a fellow alcoholic, in which case it's great advice, but that wasn't me. So do the things you're passionate about in this life, and you'll meet other people who have those passions, and there you'll find friendship and community, and who knows, maybe love, although I'm old enough to know that love comes from within and is in each of us from which it comes through perhaps toward people, toward a lover, or toward the natural world and animals for me and trees for me, which makes me feel a blissful love and a joy every day, despite this dour talk perhaps in ways I never imagined when I was in my twenties. And yet somehow I did know because perhaps like you, I also love the natural world so much. So um, my email, if anyone wants to talk further at any time is jack at treespiritproject.com you can see more of my photographs of elk and trees at treespiritproject.com. Many thanks to Walker and Kat for hosting this and the other panelists. Uh, we have more up, but um, it's, your, it's yours guys, it's your future. And I wish you well, and I will do everything to help um, to raise awareness about the role of the natural world in our lives of which we are a part. Even our language says those are different things, which is not accurate. So we're in quite a conundrum, but I'm still optimistic and depressed and optimistic every single day. So go figure. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Um, so yeah, next up we have Jared Holmes um, and he's been involved with our internship program before as a speaker about Bamberger Ranch. And so definitely excited to have him back. Thank you, Walker. Can everybody hear me? I want to make sure all my bells and whistles are on. All right, great. Well, I think this is a, a perfect segue after what Jack had just said, um, because I do happen to uh, get sometimes overly focused on the doom and gloom of life. And the Bamberger Ranch really does uh, shine through as this beacon of hope 
Um, for those that you, who aren't familiar, uh, Mr. Bamberger, our founder, who just turned 93 years young, bought the worst piece of property he could find, one that was overabused. It had too many cattle. It had too many goats. What it didn't have was water. And by working with Mother Nature through the principles that uh, Aldo Leopold brought forth with uh, the five tools that destroyed are the same five tools that can build it back, the cow, the plow, the ax, the match, and the gun. And he brought back a degraded juniper forest to a uh, very productive grassland savanna. So we still have lots of trees, but we have a lot of grass as well. And if you saw my, um, my talks for Wellkind earlier, you'll know that I'm really about the system and knowing the system. So my talk today is gonna be kind of about my system and how I came to be a professional biologist, conservationist, whatever you wanna call me. And my journey starts when I was very, very young. Um, I, uh, like, like a lot of us, grew up outside. I didn't have a lot of means. The one thing we always were able to do was go outside. Um, my father was a school teacher uh, who eventually got his uh, doctorate and then became a university professor. So when we weren't in school, we were his field techs. We were free labor for him. So uh, we literally grew up camping all over the, the East Coast, the United States, all the way down into Florida, uh, chasing snakes and chasing lizards for the research he was doing. So I learned all of these really valuable field techniques when I was a kid, but really what I learned how to do is have fun outside like we were supposed to. And I had this sense of community with my family who was also doing that. We didn't know that we didn't have money. We, we didn't know that, um, oh, let me see if I can focus that. Ugh. We didn't know that uh, knowing the local butcher and going to school with, with uh with his son meant that they felt bad for us and gave us a better deal on, on meat uh, for the family. And it really wasn't until we got into middle school when my mom started a business and we had money that life really changed for us. And then the whole context of going to college and not just being like a dirty hippie kid um, kind of came to, came to the forefront. And so going through college, um, I started taking all sorts of weird jobs that I could get a hold of during the summer. A, because as a kid that loved being outside, I, I just wanted to get paid to go outside and I wanted to pay to get to, to travel. Um, so I did the things that my true passion in life, snakes and lizards, like to eat. I studied, you know, small mammals in West Texas. And then I went back to the East Coast in North Carolina and, and did surveys for, uh, for different snakes. But really, I grew up on these talus slopes in Pennsylvania, and I got my first paying job as a biologist when I was 16, um, playing with rattlesnakes on the talus slopes. And these rattlesnakes, even in the, in the 90s when I was doing this, were already thought to be going extinct. Um, there were different mountain ranges uh, where they'd already been extirpated, and then you had uh, rattlesnake roundups popping all over. It wasn't just Texas that was having rattlesnake roundups. They were in Pennsylvania, they were in New Hampshire, they were in Vermont, and the life history and the, and the life strategy of timber rattlesnakes is completely different than the western diamondback rattlesnake, which is what gets exploited here in the American Southwest. Diamondback rattlesnakes can take it, timber rattlesnakes cannot. Um, so I really just kind of traveled all over and never said no to a job. Um, and, you know, I, I got to go to different companies or different countries. And I've been to now 38 of the, uh, wait, hold on. No, 48 states. I just have to get to Alaska and Hawaii. There's, there's no snakes in Alaska and Hawaii. So it's hard to venture there for me. Um, but uh, really, while I was doing all of this, it's, hard to make a living when you're paying student loan debt and being a field tech living life outside. So somehow, uh, because I grew up um, just kind of learning how to do things myself, I learned how to weld, uh, I learned how to do woodworking. And uh, my cousins and I opened up a business where we were fabricating. And I was making a ton of money building high end homes. Um, this is an actual a 3D elevator. Um, that on, on Lake Travis there in Austin that was being built. And yeah, I loved the money and it was awesome being creative and, um, and, and using woods. The, all the woodwork you see here is from Eastern Red Cedar, which is an invasive species 
here in Central Texas, but nothing filled my bucket the way grabbing my snakes and talking in front of a crowd did. And so when I was able to, to did a full-time job out here at the uh, Bamberger Ranch Preserve, I kind of really realized the power of education and the power of, of my knowledge of biological systems was. Because, you know, here is this beacon of hope that is the Bamberger Ranch Preserve, where we see 3,000 school-age kids every year, and we get to teach them about how one person can make a difference. You know, Mr. Bamberger grew up poor without running water and electricity in his house. He was a door-to-door -door vacuum cleaner salesman before he sold fried chicken. And then when he sold fried chicken, he bought the worst piece of property he could, restored it, and then he gave it away. $50 million worth of real estate from a person who, even at 93, still lives in the Depression era. Okay? So he just gave that away and formed this because he knew the value of sharing this with the next generations. And he could even see, even back in the 70s and 80s, how private landowners can't rely on the government. Private landowners have to rely on themselves, and they have to rely on the information that they know to make the system, i.e. the land, better and more productive. And whether that's better to be a sustainable um, cattle ranching operation, which Jack, I agree, there's no such thing as sustainable cattle. There is sustainable bison. Um, but, you know, so when you think about your careers, I, I really, I, you don't have to be the hardest worker. You don't have to be the smartest. You don't have to get the best grades. You just have to know where that intersection is. And you have to know your limits, focus on your strengths, but recognize your weaknesses so that you're always improving on them. You know, and the day-to-day -day skills, so many interns come to me and they don't know how to use a power drill. They don't know how to start a lawnmower. And I don't expect every kid, you know, 18, 19 years old to drive a standard transmission or be able to back up a truck and trailer. But those are the job skills that I'm seeing now are setting you apart, um, are setting these, these kids that are going into full-time employment apart. When you think about working for the park service, you know, you have to be able to drive a truck and trailer. You have to know what four-wheel drive is and when to use it. So there's just a, a lot to it. And so I guess really what I'm trying to tell you is you have to know how to communicate yourself effectively and your job effectively. And you have to, be, you have to do it outside. I, I don't see how anybody can be happy working indoors. It's fine to do this for a couple hours, but you have life is better outside. And you got to be well-rounded too. Don't pigeonhole yourself. Um, you know, I went to a major university, Texas A&M, um, and I, I was very fortunate that there were internships and volunteer opportunities, but I was more fortunate to understand that that 10,000 hour rule is real because when you're living that lifestyle and you're outside all of the time, it doesn't really feel like work. Surrounding yourself with coworkers that make the job fun makes those long hours easier. Something that my, my advisor always reminds me of on the regular is that there's a lot of job-like aspects to every job. You can't expect it to be fun 100% of the time. If you're out banding birds, you got to go sit in front of a computer and you have to enter that data. It's just part of it. Uh, just like Cam said with collecting all of that, that field stuff and putting it in those small tents, that stinks. I collect bat guanu, I'm stinky, it, it's a hot job. Um, and, I, and then I have to go to the computer, fill out all the paperwork and then send it off to the lab and then wait for them to send it back. So it's just a lot and that's just part of the job. And when you realize the power that you can have with that though, it makes it a little easier. And so again, just the relationships that you form with people in the field just make life easier. These are still my best friends. Um, we don't get together a lot, but we spent so many long hours. Little known fact as a field tech, you get paid for somewhere between 20 and 30 hours, but you're really working like 60, 70, 80 hours in the field. So if it isn't for your friends and being a goofball um, out there, it gets really hard. You know, you gotta find when you're outside and you're working, you have to find those little moments where you can develop an alter, ego, an alter ego like Ponch Mustachio. And you have to know when you can you know, take photographs of your friends in incriminating positions because you might do a career panel one day and, and need to, uh, to blow their spot up. Um, but I think really what I wanna end this with before I um, uh, you know, 
shut up and let the uh, next person talk is life is just better outside and, and find what you're passionate about. Your career doesn't, it's not linear. You know, when you look at all of this, like it, you're going to go up and down, you're going to bounce back and forth and financial freedom is freedom. I want to reiterate what, what Kat said. I, if I was debt free, oh, the things I could do, um, it would really, uh, it would change a lot, a lot of things, especially now with a almost two-year-old, um, you know, so when you think about climate change and how it's affecting jobs and where you might go as a career, know that I work for a nonprofit. There are a lot more nonprofits out there now, and there's a lot of nonprofits working just specifically for climate change. But there's a lot of private ranches that also want biologists. I get a lot of job offers um, from people that come out and see the ranch about, hey, you want to be my private biologist? I'll triple your pay. And yeah, money is great, but what's the impact there? Uh, if, if I'm out on some ranch in the middle of nowhere, and yeah, it's great to have 55,000 acres or 100,000 acres to be the biologist on, but it's a lonely world if you don't get to share it with anybody. You know, ha half the fun of being in the Vandenberger Ranch is making fun of the kids when they don't know what poison ivy is, you know, and then going, ah, here's your aha moment. This is what poison ivy is, um, you know, so just go outside and just know that there's a lot of different jobs available out there. Don't turn an experience down. There are two things that no one will ever be able to take away from you, your experiences and your education. Get them both. And remember, always be herping. Hashtag ABH. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Jared. I I love um I love how you emphasize just something um, how important the passion is because like as you said, every work is going to have its boring moments, and being passionate about your job is kind of what's going to get you through those. But then also, not thinking of careers as like a limiting thing. Like I think a lot of people my age, um, especially in the interns' age we get caught up in trying to find a set path or trying to find the exact job we want to do. But it seems like every one of you guys so far really emphasize just how important kind of taking on experiences and being flexible, develop a kind of well-rounded set of skills. Thanks. Uh, yeah, next up we have Zachary Ellis, uh, the co-owner and operator of Catalyst Bio Amendments. Let's put him on the spotlight. Okay. So thank you to all the hosts and to all the presenters before me. Um, <laughs> it's all been really touching already. Um, I grew up in rural Western New York, um, south of Buffalo. Uh, living on and around small scale dairies and agriculture land. I, my first job, I think, was picking hay when I was probably nine years old. Um, and I spent all of my life outside when I was a kid. If I wasn't working outside, then we were building forts, playing tag just anything I could do to stay outside. You know, our, my parents would kick me out of the house in the morning and they wouldn't expect to see me until after dark. And that wasn't hard for me. <laughs> you know, like that's what I did every day. And so that connection to nature just came naturally and at a young age for me. Um, and I never wanted or could work inside after that. I grew up in a construction family, I was fourth generation union carpenter. <clears throat> so almost all of our work was outside. And if I got assigned to a job that was inside, I just didn't take it. Um, <clears throat> so with that said, you know, I went, ended up going to school, school for construction management. And I went down that path for a few years, but there was a really high stress, unhealthy work environment for me. Um, and I did that until about six years ago, uh, at which point I 
decided to change my life. Um, I moved to California without having any real plan. Um, and the only plan I had was just to get healthy and to be a healthier person. <clears throat> so all of that, that career health or that, that personal health path really quickly led me to our food, our agricultural systems and nutrient density of food. At about the same time, I started reading a book called Teeming, Teeming with Microbes by Jeff Lowenfels, and I, I highly recommend that book. Um, it's what opened the door to the microbial life that lives underneath our feet for me. It completely blew my mind with the interactions, you know, highlighting the interactions that plants and microbes have in the soil. And it was really, you know, the entrance to the wormhole for me. And um, it just never stopped, you know. Uh, from there, I uh, got into Dr. Elaine Ingham's work on with, within the Soil Food Web and Soil Food Web School. <laughs> and um, ended up searching out um, a permaculture class in, that was in the local area um, with a guy named Matthew Trump, because I knew he had worked with Elaine for four or five years and helped her with her composting program at the Environmental Celebration Institute. <laughs> and in that class, it really, really opened my eyes to systems thinking. You know, I, I was already, already extremely connected to nature, but I didn't always think about how the, all those systems interacted. And it was, it just became my passion after that. Um, after that class, it pushed me further down the soil food web wormhole. I signed up for Elaine's classes, started taking her online school, and uh, and that's you know the confluence of how how the how this business started. We ended up meeting my current business partners at a microscope intensive a couple couple months after that class, <laughs> and we started talking about how we could regenerate soil and improve our food systems. And we quickly had the understanding that we needed this base material, this biologically focused compost to, to do that, to really get out and regenerate re rapidly. And there just wasn't anybody doing it. And I had construction and heavy equipment background. Everybody else had a piece of the puzzle to make it work. You know, Keisha was, already extremely proficient on the microscope. <laughs> and so we decided to move forward. Um, and it happened really quick. We found the property that we currently operate on within a couple of weeks. Um, we leased it a couple of weeks after that. Um, we bought a compost turner pretty quickly. And I'd say within a month of leasing the property, we had built our first compost pile. And so for us, it's really been a, a kind of learn on the fly, down the wormhole experience. We'd are all, all completed um, Dr. Lane's courses, but that's really just the tip of the iceberg. So we've continued our education, mostly self-taught the whole way through. Uh, I'm gonna talk about, you know, why why we started Catalyst. And it was really out of that necessity that, that I had mentioned before, that there was nobody else really making biologically focused compost. And it was from those classes and from permaculture that we came to the understanding of how bad our ag soils and our world soils were being degraded. Repeated applications of chemicals and pesticides and fertilizer were destroying the the microbiome of the soil. So for us, it was a call to action. You know, it, it, it was something that we, we had to do. Um, <clears throat> we knew that to, to do this regeneration work that we had to have that base material. Um, and so that kind of leads me into the day-to-day -day of Catalyst operations. And being an owner-operated business, 
we kind of do it all, you know, we anywhere from materials collection, we spend a lot of time with pitchforks in our hands, going out and finding manures and wood chips and green materials. And there's a really long vetting process for all of that material for us. We have to make sure that we talk to the producers of that material know what their input materials are, know if they're using pesticides or herbicides. And if it's a, if it's a manure, we have to talk to them about their worming practices, their antibiotic use practices. And all of that determines whether or not we can even use the material to build our compost. So unlike most compost companies that work in waste reduction, we're intentionally seeking out our input materials. All of them, all of them have an intention within the compost, <laughs> which is another thing that really separates our business from most other compost companies. Most compost companies get paid tipping fees to take their green waste and the materials in, whereas we try to form a relationship, work with our producers, and actually pay them to make sure that our, our input materials are as clean as possible. And all of that is for a reason. And, and that reason is the importance of, of soil health. Soil holds the key to ecological health. Without healthy living soil, all of our other systems fail. It ties into all ecosystem health. Healthy soil has the structure, which is created the, by the microbiology, organic matter, and microscopic life that is essential for the proper nutrient and water cycles to sustain above ground life. And the soil food web really drives all of this. The bacteria and fungi in the soil food web system are our primary decomposers. <laughs> They're the first step into breaking down organic material and other leaf litters, stuff like that, into nutrients that are plant available. <laughs> Excuse me. And so that soil food web community lives all or part of its life in the soil. The soil food web is fueled by primary producers, which are plants, lichens, mosses, and photo photosynthetic bacteria. And they form a relationship with primary decomposers, right? Which are the bacteria and fungi, nematodes, and protozoa within our soil systems. And what's really cool about this is the relationship that's formed within that. So our plants actually you know, use, use photosynthesis to produce complex sugars and carbohydrates. And they I think they use about 60% of their energy to pump those into the soil to build those soil food web communities, the soil biology around them. And it's done for a lot of reasons, but mostly because that soil, that soil biology is what feeds our plants. They, they sometimes form these uh, symbiotic relationships, which they will, the plants will excrete, exude a certain composition of uh, carbohydrates or sugars that attracts certain biology. That biology goes out and mines certain nutrients for the plant and brings them back. And it's an exchange, one exchange for the other. <laughs> and that's primarily you know, how, how this system works. But there's also new science every day that teaches us more and more about how these systems work. It's one of my favorite parts about the field is that. Okay. So I think unfortunately might be having some uh, connectivity issues. So uh, we'll go ahead and move on to the next part of our event, which will be a Q&A session. Um, the Q&A session will be led um, at first by our interns, but um, then I'm gonna open things up to the public. 
So if you guys in the audience have any questions or any of our panelists, uh, feel free to write them in the Q&A and I will bring those up after our interns have each asked one of their questions. So here we go. I'm just gonna promote our interns. And great. Okay, so the first question from our intern is coming from Annalie Camperin. And let's follow it here. All right. Okay. Um, my first question is, what is one thing in your field that made you know, like, this is what I want to do? Oh, and this is for which speaker? Okay, uh, so that was for Jared Holmes. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, you know, I think the very first thing is, is as a professional wildlife presenter, the, the first time I pull a snake out of a bag and just see the kids light up and see and just knowing that you have their attention and they're going to listen to you and you can actually educate them. It doesn't have to be this big sensationalist thing um, like the crocodile hunter where there's a little bit of education with a lot of entertainment. You know, edutainment is a real thing. And, and when I, the first time I was able to do that, it really kind of let me know that, yeah, this is, I'm, I'm where I want to be full time. And next up. I wanted to also address okay. Annalie's uh, question. Annalie, I, I would suggest that sometimes we find in our careers what we love the most um, based on what we did as you know, growing up and times that uh, we felt really fulfilled and successful. And so even looking at, at what you've liked to do so far in life and where you've had those, those uh, moments of um, feeling you're in the moment, you're in the, in the zone, so to speak, and thinking about what kinds of ways to find work where you can repeat those experiences too. Thank you. Um, then next up, we have Ariana Pelletieri. Hi, I have a question for Catriona. And my question is, what has been the experience that's helped, that you've had that's helped you the most in your career? I would say the experience that has helped me the most in my career is continuing to follow uh, what I enjoy and love. And sometimes, again, as you know, Jared mentioned, all of us can. You, you're, there's sometimes there are things that you do through work that might be boring or you know to help carry you through. And also, there have been times I've had to make decisions, um, like when I left um, my legal career. I practiced environmental law for almost eight years. And that was a big decision to kind of take a leap of faith. But what held me through and continued on, and I, I never look back, um, is the love of what I do and, and following that passion and being brave to stay, stay the course, being brave to stay the course, because we're all gonna face challenges, whether it's our day-to-day -day job or our career choices and just staying true, true to self. Okay, and I just wanted to bring up um, a question from our audience because uh, it's been upvoted. It's a really good one. Um, this is for anyone who'd like to speak on it, um, but um, Charmaine Dalazay asks, 
how do you stay hopeful while working in the environmental field? I just read the new IPC report and I'm feeling scared and like we are never going to reach our climate goals, but I want to be positive. Can I speak to that? Sure. Yeah, so um, thank you for a very uh, profound and adult uh, question, Charmaine. And I mean, oddly enough, the first thing I'd say is it's okay to feel the sadness and the despair and the frustration and, and all of that. You can't deny it or suppress it. Um, so sort of, I've learned very late in life in my 40s actually through some emotional growth work, whatever that means, um, that I was, when I was younger, I didn't want to feel the bad stuff. So I would just push it down and pretend everything was okay. And I got really good at that, especially in New York and the New York culture um, near the city where you sort of, you know, just have a cup of coffee at 11 o'clock at night and get back to work and sleeping is for losers and like, wow, just go, 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 go. And then this stuff is cooking on the inside. So just allowing those feelings to um, exist is, is one thing that's necessary. And then absolutely you wanna be positive and go out in the world and um, work from a place of love and hope and optimism because it's more powerful and it feels better. And then you'll also, um, in doing any kind of work, especially environmental work, you'll find fast friends. So Jared sounds like, and you saw the picture of the joy and all those kids around him holding a snake. And like, you know, he's basking in the love of all those kids and feeling connected and he's found his purpose. And in those moments, you know, yeah, he can, you know, somewhere there's the big picture of, oh, we're all, well, he doesn't do it necessarily, but it's tough out there and the IPC, uh, IPCC report and such. But in that moment, He's alive, he's connected to his passion, he's connecting to other kids and community in the passion, and you're free in the moment. So it's sort of like a meditation in a way where we have to think about things in the past to motivate us to do things in the future. And those are necessary exercises. It's what we do in society so much. But then I'm revealing my 25 years in California now. Then there's the meditative aspects of life where joy is. In fact, it's the only place actual life is. So it's kind of a choice. Like, okay, I'm feeling bad now. I'm going to allow that and not deny it. And now I'm going to refocus and say, okay, I have friends or I want to go outside and do something or I want to go outside and do something with my passion toward a career or in my career. And there's joy in those moments. So it's not one thing. It's very complex and there's waves and ups and downs. It's uh, as someone said, probably for New York, it's the whole catastrophe, all of it. Great. And um, as a related question, we have, Isabella, uh, who had a pretty good one for you, Jack. Hi, um, so I was wondering how art can have a role in environmental activism in the future, and if you have any tips on how to best um, use it um, in educating the public and making change when it comes to environmental issues. Uh, great question, and first I'd say um, thanks for the question, super powerful. Um, what is your artwork to be more specific and see if I can tie it into what you do or what you like to do since I'm assuming you're an artist of some sort. Yeah, I do enjoy painting and drawing just that kind of medium. Okay. Um, I don't, I can't draw a lick. <laughs> That's why I take pictures. It's the lazy man's way, although you got to be good at that too. So as far as painting or drawing or illustration of any sort, um, I think uh, it was Tolstoy who said a, a great little quip that I read off of Crosstown bus in New York a thousand years ago, and it was art is not a handicraft, it is the transmission of feeling experienced by the artist. So if you're calling and you feel compelled, you want to paint what you see, then absolutely do that and trust it's going to lead you somewhere. And you know, there's usually some impetus, you know, inside you, the passion to do it. And then typically, unless you're really lucky, you know, you develop skills as well along the way, unless you're just gifted with that too, like apparently Mozart was. Um, and then you create your artwork and then you share it with people. And if it's good art, whatever that means, that's a topic, um, then other people will feel moved by your feeling expressed in your artwork. And then it, it's a communication tool. And, you know, that's a whole world too of commercial art and art for uh, nonprofit environmental organizations or as an entrepreneur selling your own artwork as I've done with my photographs. There's lots of ways to do that in our, you know, capital society where we exchange goods and services for money so we can do stuff and buy things. But absolutely, art is super powerful. And there's lots of examples of great painters, you know, who have, <laughs> when they weren't back in, you know, Mozart's day, you know, uh, painting uh, on the side maybe for a court for money, 
but then also using these days artwork directly to, well, I know you a little bit, Isabella, um, but something that you're passionate about, paint those things and show them to people and get them out there in the world, which takes courage, you know, fear of rejection and all that is part of it. Another conversation. Um, so do those, those ramblings help a little bit? Yeah, thank you. Sure. I also saw um, that Jared had his hand up earlier um, in response to the question about staying positive. Yeah, I did. Thank, thanks for uh, letting me go back to that. Um, you know, I, I think one thing all of us have to keep in mind too is that the world's been changing, you know, since the dawn of time. And the only species to ever go extinct are one that cannot adapt to a changing environment. And being the most adaptable species in the history of this planet, whether you think that's good or bad, I mean, we're also the most invasive species on this planet. So I think you know where I feel with that one. Um, Given enough time, Mother Nature can heal itself. It didn't get in this condition overnight, and it's not going to fix itself overnight. And it's the, the generations coming up now asking these questions and being aware of these questions. Uh, when I grew up, water was a renewable resource. I don't think they've taught it as a renewable resource in at least a decade. Um, and, you know, so it's really just kind of keeping the context of it all. There's, there's not a single problem on this earth I don't think that somebody somewhere out there cannot fix. And I think the climate is something too. You know, there's a lot of those solar powered um, free carbon scrubbers that we call plants and more people becoming aware of uh, centropy and, and, and bioagronomics and just reforesting putting your grasslands back, moving to small scale, community-based agriculture. There's a lot of little changes that add up to big changes and it takes time. And, and that's, that's just it. We just have to give it time. It's not a, this is not an Amazon get it next day type thing. Um, and climate change, climate change will never be like that no matter how much we want that. And so we just, we have to stop moving the goalposts and just all start working together but that's inherently hard giving our species as well. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. I also see, um, so yeah, um, it looks like Zach had, um, they, there was actually a power outage in his office, but he's soldiered on and he's back in the meeting outside. So I'm gonna bring it to Jake Uries who had a good question for him. Yeah, so in Catalyst Bio Amendments, you're involved with dealing with microbial life. So I was wondering if you see a way to introduce microbial life into roots of plants and trees in order to combat nutrient loss due to climate change. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> so when we farm with conventional farming systems, we're replacing the need for the microbiology. We're taking their jobs away when we're force feeding plants. So our job is to look at that system as a whole and do our best to, to create the conditions that foster that microbial life or bring it back in with an amendment product like the one that we have. And so we use microscopy to ensure that all the sets of biology necessary for nutrient cycling to occur are contained in our compost before we ever sell it. Most of the people that we sell compost to, we end up taking soil samples from or having them send soil samples to us later from their from the rhizosphere from their root zone so that we can check and make sure that that biology is still living and thriving there um, and there's a lot of different ways to to get it get it to the root zone you know you can apply the solid solid amendment at the time of planting or if it's you know the plants are already established the best way that we have to, to get it to the root zone after that is to make a compost extract. And that's just simply, you know, fusing the compost in the, it, into water and creating a solution and either pouring it around the drip line of the plant, that's where water would naturally drip off a plant's leaves, or we even have root zone injectors that we use a diaphragm pump to pump the, the, the um, nutrient solution, the biological solution directly to the root zone. Love your office, by the way, Zachary. <laughs> Isn't it, it's much better out here. Totally. <laughs> and 
So this is one that was written by um, Aiden Tribole. He's uh, one of our interns and fortunately can make it today. But he was wondering um, for Cameron, what fields will ensure that plants keep up with climate change so that we don't end up with global food shortages? And will those changes be enacted through things like genetic engineering, gene splicing, et cetera, or are there other ways? That is a super excellent question. Um, I feel like I can only probably answer part of it. Um, I mean, I, there's nothing that this is actually probably more of an ethical question too, or at least it gets into it. Uh, I mean, genetic engineering is so pervasive and agricultural already uh, that it has already done a ton and will continue to do a ton in terms of feeding the entire population. But uh, I personally think that it's, I don't know, I think it's gonna come down because the amount of people that we're gonna have on the planet in the relatively short future is gonna be, it's, it's gonna totally outweigh the amount of space required to feed that population. So I don't even necessarily, I don't know, I don't really know what the answer is. I mean, yeah, certainly genetic engineering is going to help with that. I think that I think that that's probably going to be the answer, considering unless there's some monumental, drastic change in policy. Like, if all of society changes and <laughs> and genetic engineering is no longer socially acceptable or um, kind of the primary technological driver in the area of agriculture. I don't see what else could be. I think that grassroots level uh, agricultural movements, whether it be like biodynamic farming, regenerative agriculture, or things of that nature um, will be helpful. Uh, but that would require a lot of individuals coming together to make that happen. Um, and a lot of the plants that grow now uh, naturally will not be able to grow in a lot of places that they historically have been able to because of climate change. And I think that that's where genetic engineering is definitely going to have to play a part. So I don't know if that fully answers the question, but those are just my thoughts. Then we have uh, another question from the chat. Uh, this is from Geo Debs and she asks, um, I personally live in South Florida and find that cities and code are moving in the wrong direction. I feel the need to leave and live somewhere more peaceful, somewhere they are, quote unquote, doing it right, be that another state or even abroad. How do you feel about people moving to flee degenerative lifestyles versus staying and trying to change the system? And this is for anyone who wants to weigh in. I was just typing an answer to her. I'll, I'll okay. save myself the typing and, and doing this with a computer while I'm talking. Um, there's no simple answer. I, I wish it was black or white. It, I, I don't think it is in my humble opinion. Um, and I was just going to say, to start with, make a list of the pluses and minuses of staying and fighting. Although I don't actually believe in fighting, I believe in advocacy of what you're for in a place and you can change things versus you know the uh, probably the lighter feeling of I'm just going to get out of here and go somewhere else I would also then write down the list of places you're thinking of fleeing to um, and how different it would be and then you're going to have to ponder that there's no I mean for me I guess I thought about that and like would I feel guilty if I left or no it's just I feel too oppressed and I, I'm just depressed all day by staying in a place I'm not happy with for me I left my childhood home of New York City there for mostly 35 years and well, it's my home, my family. And it's like, I just, I really was, I became clear over a few years of agonizing over it that I needed to go, in my case, West young man out to California. And I never looked back, really happy I did it. And now I look coming, it's fun. I'm actually, again, I'm visiting New York right now because hey, it's fun to come here among this, you know, urban and sad, uh, urban busyness, excuse me. Um, but I feel lighter of spirit and happier. Um, again, despite my earlier doom and gloom mood I was on. So, um, Make a list, ponder the choices, talk with friends, and give yourself a break. Whichever choice you make is fine, and none of it's permanent. You can move again, especially I'm assuming you're younger. Uh, it gets a little harder, not impossible when you're older. Hope some of that helps. 
I'd like to add to that too. And thank you, Jack. I think a lot of that's really valuable um, considerations. And by doing that list, you know, kind of have more of an objective, you know, perspective. Um, I would also say the what sustains you is really critical to look at because uh, it's hard to stand alone in this world. Think about if you were yourself a tree, um, what would sustain you? What kind of soil do you need? What kind of community do you need? Um, what kind of living conditions? What kind of economic conditions? You know, there's different economic conditions in different parts of the, the country and so forth. And then, um, yeah, and then look at your heart, you know, but, but definitely look at what sustains you because we can't exist on our, our own. Um, and that's, that's important whether you stay where you are or you go elsewhere. And then it's fine too to choose to stay and um, be that warrior Boda Vista that I like to talk about. And, um, you know, in many ways, I feel the call to go to Edinburgh, to Scotland, and um, which is the land of my ancestors. My mom, I'm the only American born. And there's so many aspects of that country that just seem so right compared to the US, you know, free college, free health, uh, very low interest rates if you, if you get a mortgage. The bank pays you on your, you know, savings account like five percent. So all these good things, <laughs> and in many ways it seems like a gentler country, but they have their issues there too. Um, but you know, so matching your your passion, your heart, your brave heart, what you're here to do, uh, but ensuring you've got the support because even if you have a super brave heart, if you don't have the support, it's going to be too too difficult. So I think working with both those. Yeah, and if I can piggyback on that too, uh, beware of the devil you know, because the one that you don't might be worse. And living in Texas, one of the fastest growing regions in the entire country right now, it's insanity what's happening around me. And now we were just talking as an organization, again, we're an organization of five. We, we live on site, so we're kind of in our little habitat island, but we touch 47 different properties. So our, our nine square miles has 47 different properties that touch it. Each time a ranch goes for sale, it gets fragmented down a little bit more. It gets fragmented down a little bit more. And this is happening across the whole hill country. And because none of us want to play politics or, or go to a, a town hall meeting and just go, hey, maybe we should think about zoning so we don't become Austin. You know, so it's not a free for all out here. Um, so I, I really applaud those that stay and want to fight or want to have a bigger voice in that. Because we're, we're so far behind right now that I don't think we can catch up. Um, and, and that's really sad. While our 5,500 acres where I live is protected, the view shed as, as school groups will drive on, that might not be. You know, there's 1,200 acres. Um, that we have a, a mile and a half driveway that, or mile and a half road that they have to come before they get to our gate. And that's not protected. That's a cattle rancher. If he were to die, I mean, 12, 1,200 acres times 40,000 an acre, that's a lot of money. And how do you tell the four daughters to not split that up and keep living their life? Because they don't live on that ranch now. I mean, they, they were barely there um, even growing up. So it's, it's a really hard context to think about. And there, whether you go to a place like Terlingua, like, which is in West Texas, well, Terlingua is just as bad as Austin right now because everybody's moving out there. And it's, it's just like that wherever you go, property prices are insane. Um, so if you have that, that sense of place, that sense of community, stay and fight and see what you can do. And if not buy a van and go from national forest to national forest. I mean, that's the life right there. That's, that's the closest thing you can get to true freedom. I would also like to speak on that just real quick. I also think this get everything that everybody said is amazing. And I think this gets into the question of like sense of place or the concept of sense of place. And like, I grew up in LA and I, at 27 years old, have only just started to fly fish in the LA river, which might sound insane to some people, but there's a lot of beauty in LA. And I never full, like went out of my way to fully appreciate that. And to see that there are a lot of beautiful things here. Um, going out and looking at plants that I didn't know about, looking up the native Keys tribe that used to live here, looking at plants that have lived here historically and just becoming familiar with my, 
with what I'm passionate about, which is plants and the natural world uh, from a scientific perspective, um, it's given me more of a sense of place. It's helped me to feel more connected to this place. And so I think that that level of connection and sense of place is available anywhere that we go. I think it's valid, especially in, in today's world. And um, I love the quote by Aldo Leopold, I might have to paraphrase, but having an ecological education is, uh, I don't know, is to live with, um, I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's basically to be, to feel wounded all the time, like kind of perpetually wounded. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Self-compassion, self-compassion, I think is valid. I don't think there's any right or wrong choice for what you want to do, honestly. I think it's all valid. Yeah. Great. Well, I think those are the perfect words to end on. Um, just wanted to thank all of our panelists for coming, uh, sharing their advice and their inspiration. Also to our audience, um, if anyone is interested in learning more, you can go to Wellkind's website at wellkind.org. Um, you can do things like get on our mailing list, explore the forestry page, learn more about the internship. We also have a Facebook and YouTube. A recording of this presentation will go up there. And also our Instagram, which is well.kind. So thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and have fun exploring these new environmental careers. And may the forest, and may the forest be with you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. May the forest be with you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.